I'm Alana Sher. I'm an automotive journalist. I review new cars on video. I write stories about old cars. I own a ridiculous amount of cars, at least half of which are trucks. I live in Southern California, and I'm doing this podcast with an extremely cute dog sitting on my lap. You have quite a collection of cars, including your 71 Opel GT, which I think is super rad and super <laughs> awesome. We're coming off Radwood, so I have to use that word. It is. It is. Well, it, it isn't Radwood rad. It's too early for that. But um, it is a, a spectacular little car. You have a pretty varied taste, but then like a 71 Opel GT. Yeah, I would say that for the most part, my collection is definitely skewed towards muscle cars and trucks of the muscle car era. But then I've got the 71 Opel GT. I'm assuming everyone knows what an Opel GT is. <laughs> but if for some reason you yeah, don't, I definitely recommend looking it up because they're adorable. Opal, which still still makes cars, was always kind of just a, you know, like economy commuter car, a European economy commuter car. And they had a, a partnership or they were owned by GM. In And uh, in the late 60s, Opal decided that they wanted to make a sports car. They were like, well, well you know, we're going to make like a, a two-seater sports car. And, uh, and we're just going to take the world by storm. And they designed um, the Opal GT and it's so cute. It's so tiny. <laughs> it's like, it, I, I don't remember how long it is, but um, it makes a Miata look big. I once had a press car Miata and the Miata looked huge parked next to the <laughs> Opal. And it looks like a little tiny um, Corvette. Like it looks like a little itty bitty 68 era Corvette. Um, and I had, I'd never even heard of one. You know, I knew, I knew muscle cars and I knew, you know, sort of more common cars. And um, a neighbor got one. He was uh, flipping cars in Hungary. He would like mm. come here and then buy, they would buy cars and they would take them um, back to Europe and sell them. And he had this little car in their yard. I think it was yellow maybe. Um, okay. And I was, what is that? You know, <laughs> what is it? And I want it. And, uh, and that was, I don't know. I think it took maybe two or three years before I actually did get one, but it was in the back of my head. Like I need that for sure. <laughs> it's uh, I'm looking at the list here and I think <laughs> putting it next to your, uh, W250 Cummins, <laughs> that would be hilarious. And I think you, you drove the crew cab to Radwood, right? Yeah. 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 We're, we're putting it next to that. That would be hilarious. Can you fit that car in the bed of that Cummins? Um, I think it would almost fit lengthwise. Um, I mean, we'd need some ramps. Okay. That means doable. Yeah. Right? Sure. I think with a bed extender for sure. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. All right. We'll, we'll talk about the logistics of moving around the Opal. Hopefully it drives around, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I mean, and it, oh, for sure. It's my daily. Awesome. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the only reason I didn't drive it here is because I had a press car, but um, okay. yeah, that's that's my usual transportation. So, okay. Um, so it, it, it runs great. And uh, yeah, you know, I would say that that, that that car would fit into into our next biggest car. Okay. And our next biggest car would fit into our very biggest car. So Which is the wrecker? I think the biggest currently running would be the dump truck. Okay. Um, but there is a ramp truck, which obviously could fit like multiple cars on it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the logic of the cars. <laughs> Because I'm I feel like we so. got a little ahead of ourselves, you know? <laughs> you mean you and your car collection? I think it's you and your husband, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about that because uh, you did say that you're a muscle car person. There are some anomalies, we'll say, <laughs> within that. And when you hear, you know, a wrecker and a dump truck and things like that, let's let's talk philosophy of car collecting. When you partner with somebody, a lot of times their loves become your loves and mm -hmm. vice versa. And, um, you know, a lot of people who are car people, they sort of struggle with having a partner who either doesn't like cars, which I think is really hard, or just sort of tolerates cars, which right. honestly, if you're partnered with somebody and they just tolerate cars, like that's great. You should feel lucky because that's fine. It's, you know, but... Um, for some of us who end up partnered with somebody who shares the same hobby, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty great, right. but it does have a danger, which is that there's nobody stopping you. Like you just build on each other's interests until you end up with really weird things. Cause normally like in a normal relationship, 
If you already owned three trucks and one person was like, I'm gonna bring home a Ford, uh, like a Ford Wrecker, like a, you know, like a tow truck from the 60s. Right. The other person might say like, we already have three trucks. <laughs> so I don't really think you should do that. Right. Um, but if you are in one of these sort of enabling relationships, sure. then um, the second person is like, oh yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you end up with six trucks. What do you guys do with these things? <laughs> I mean, obviously the obvious answer is drive, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's, we'll, we'll back up a little bit. Um, when I first met Tom, he drove a 69 Charger, which okay. he still has. That was his daily driver. And I drove a um, 72 Dodge Challenger. That okay. was my daily driver. And those were the only cars that we had. Okay. Um, and then, you know, uh, we we were together longer and we moved in together and eventually got married. And, you know, we got a truck because we do a lot of stuff that needs a truck. And sure. Tow it. You know, we were racing. You, if you're towing to a, a race car, um, you know, you need a truck. And then we got a race, like a dedicated race car. And then, um, when his mom passed away, we inherited another car and, you know, we had some various different interests that came and went that needed that each one sort of ended up with a car like, Oh, I'm kind of fascinated by dune buggies. And then all of a sudden there's like a Manx project or, <laughs> you know, like, like, Oh, did you see that Don Prudhomme rebuilt the snake and mongoose ramp trucks? And, how cool would it be to have a ramp truck and we should look for one and then you find one and then you buy one. And right. then the next thing you know, you've, you've got a lot of vehicles. Sure. It seems crazy to look at it from the outside, but each, each one followed a logical progression and each one was sort of part of a particular interest at the time. Mm -hmm. And with some of them, that interest has either passed or been surpassed by a new interest, but okay. the vehicle remains like, I have a, a drag car and um, it's not that I don't still like drag racing. It's just, there's no time. There's no track near yeah, me. Yeah. So, and there used to be like, we used to go to, out to LACR twice a week and, right. and that was great. We'd go drag racing, but I don't want to get rid of the drag car. Cause I, I would still like to race again. Sure. Yeah. So. And you have to drive out to what, what's the closest drag racing place? Um, Irwindale is probably the closest mileage wise, mm -hmm. um, but, it, and it's a great track. It's really fun. Um, if you're a Los Angeles person, Thursday nights, 20 bucks, you can race whatever you want. You know, you could race your commuter car. It's not a big deal. And if you haven't done it, highly recommend, super fun, but it's, um, it's an eighth mile, which isn't quite as much fun as quarter mile. And mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of traffic to get from where we are, which is the Valley ish <laughs> right now, if you're wondering. And, um, and then you know, they don't really run a whole lot of sort of serious racing there. Like they don't do like bracket races or, or kind of organized competition races. It's more like fun runs. Sure. So um, it's a lot of work to go to just, to just run. Sometimes you want to win, you want to win a trophy. I usually like to do this. I like to go way, way back. I want to hear this story. <laughs> so tell me the story. Way, way back. All right. Okay. I'm going to go way, way back. So... A lot of times people say like, oh, you must have come from a car family. Mm -hmm. And no, it couldn't be any further from the truth. There is no one else in my family who likes cars. In fact, everyone else in my family drives either a Prius or a Camry. That's awful. And um, they do not like driving. <laughs> and when they can just Uber, they would just rather do that. So none of them like cars. Okay. But when I was growing up, my mom drove a 68 Chevy Impala. I'm not old enough for that to be a normal thing for one's mom to drive. Everybody else's mom was driving like Radwood era wagons and minivans. So like it was an old car when I was growing up and I didn't at the time love it. I thought it was weird and I was embarrassed by it, but uh, there was something about it that must have stuck with me. Um, maybe it was just the idea that you could love an old car or that a car was not a normal appliance, right? Like. Sure. My folks weren't wealthy, but they could have bought a different car. But my mom liked that car because she learned how to drive in that car. And it was her parents' car. And she had an emotional attachment to it. If I go all the way back and I think about that, I think that was probably the first time that I thought of a car being almost more like a family member than a tool that you have. So 
then if you fast forward, cause I never, I didn't learn how to drive. I didn't learn to drive as a teenager. I didn't go, like I didn't get a license until I was 21. But if you fast forward to then, and I got my license and I got a 73 Plymouth Duster was my first car. Okay. And, uh, and I think I got that car. I think the reason that I liked it um, was this idea like, oh, it's, it's like, it's like an old car and therefore it's got a personality to it and it's going to be more like a pet or something. Okay. And, <laughs> and it really was, I mean, I really was very fond of it and I thought it was, I thought it was very cute. And, um, and through that car, I met a lot of people who were in the automotive industry mm-hmm. and I liked them. And it was just like such a different group of people than who I had met in school and stuff who I also liked, but I mean, I went to art school. It was totally different scene. And then I kind of met these, these car folk and there was something just a little bit more on the surface about them. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, when you, when you really get into it, they're like, all people are the same, but all, like, I just felt like there was less complications going on to make friends with folks there. It was like, you already knew what you liked right. and that you knew that you had something in common and there was something really easy about that. So I enjoyed the community and it kind of just grew from there. I mean, everything, everyone I met through there sort of led to another adventure or learning something new or being interested in something new. And, uh, it, it was all really nice. Like it was one of those things where you come to it late. And as soon as you get it, you're like, Oh, this was it. Like I should have been here so much, like so much earlier, but now that I am here, I'm never leaving. It's easy to meet car people when you go to like a meet. Is that what happened? Yes. Uh, yeah, I definitely. Okay. So my, my introduction to car people was my neighbor, Damien, um, who is still a car person today, but <laughs> he was sort of the first, um, I mean, I knew him through music and art cause he was a musician in the, in the LA scene, but he always had a cool car. Um, and he was really into them. And when I was going to buy a car, cause you don't think about this, but if you don't get a driver's license when you're young and there's mm-hmm. an adult around you to help you, like, how do you even test drive a car? Sure. Like I didn't even, I couldn't even test drive a car when I was shopping for a car cause I didn't know how to drive. And so we would go and we would answer, it was before Craigslist. It was like recycler era. And so we would like look at the recycler ads on Thursday and then set up appointments for the weekend. And like, he would drive me out and we would look at the cars. He would drive them and I would just sort of ride and be like, (laughs) well, I like this interior and I like the way that this looks or I like the way that this sounds or I don't like this. And, you know, and he would be like, "Mm, I think there's something wrong with this one. So, (laughs) and, uh, you know, so that was, it was just so awesome of him to do that. And I will forever be grateful. And then we got the car and he, and I learned how to drive on it. So, um, and once I had a license, uh, I started going to like Bob's big boy, which was sort of just over the hill from where we lived in Hollywood. And I met all these car people and some of them, you know, like when you do get into a car scene, it's like, there's so many different groups, right? Like, like there's this super grouchy old guys who go to a car show like at four o'clock to like get their spot and right, they like right. really don't have any interest in talking to you yeah. at all like because they're just sort of like yeah I got my deuce coupe and I'm sitting here and then there's you know maybe the like a slightly like tougher crew the street race crew that kind of comes later and they all you know kind of chest bump <laughs> <laughs> like, the 1320 you know, crew put all their uh, put up all their back hair up like see right. who's bigger. And, uh, and then there's like sort of all these people kind of in between, like, sure. you know, um, but it was fun to kind of see all these different groups in one place and then see who was friendly and, you know, who was into, who was into my car. That was really fun. Hmm. Um, and so I started meeting people that way and, um, you know, getting to like, oh, I met this guy, Ed, and he's a mechanic at this shop that specializes in, you know, Chrysler product muscle cars. So now I'm going to go visit the shop and learn more about Chrysler products. And, oh, he's, you know, he just gave me a ride around the block in a Hemi car. I'm like, holy crap, now I know what a Hemi is. And right. <laughs> it was just, it's weird because you always, you don't realize when you're learning, you know, you think you're just doing stuff and having fun. And then you look back at it of, a few months or a few years later and you're like, holy crap. Yeah. I didn't know any of that before. And now it, it seems impossible that I didn't know it. Right. So that was kind of, 
what that was all like. And that was when I met Tom too. Um, okay. It was about um, maybe two or three years after I learned how to drive and was driving. And um, I, I bought another car, I bought this Challenger and I was going to build an engine. I was like, yeah, I'm going to build, <laughs> it's not going to be hard. You know, I'm smart. I have a book. Yeah. And yeah. So I had an engine and it was in the living room. I l- lived in this house in Hollywood and, you know, I'd got fairly far in like the machining and prep um, process, mm-hmm. but, and I had new parts and everything. Cause that, that you can kind of figure out from reading. Yeah. It's like Legos, but, you know? Yeah. But then I was like the actual assembly. I was like, this is not, it doesn't look like it does on the 2d pictures. <laughs> and right. so, so I'd asked my friend Ed, I was like, dude, what do I do? And he's, he's like, well, you should talk to that guy, Tom. He's really smart. And, uh, um, and it turns out that Tom worked at the time he still does, but, uh, down the street from where I lived, um, his family owns a drum store music and, okay. um, and he ran the like publishing side of that. So, uh, I was, you know, didn't even think like, Oh, you're supposed to pay people for this. <laughs> Cause you know how, like when you're young and you're really into something yeah. and it's your fun thing, sure. it doesn't occur to you that other people do it for work. And right. therefore maybe don't think it's that fun. Right. Um, you know, cause he built engines on the side. He had been an engine machinist for 10 years before, before he went into the family business. So anyway, I'm an idiot and I'm just like, help me build an engine. Ha, it's in my house. And he told me <laughs> later, he was just like, yeah, he's like, I just wanted to see like what this setup was. And so he came over and helped me put this engine together. And he asked me out about a week later. So, so my mom had this Impala. Emotional attachment to it. It right. had a name. His name was Daisy. And my dad was an engineer. And he used to work on the car. He was not a mechanic, but he would work on the car. And he would fix other things mm-hmm. in the house as well. I think it just stuck with me that it's possible to fix things. It's possible to love things right. that are inanimate objects. And it's possible to fix things sure. that are inanimate objects. And so when I finally got to the car world, when I finally got my own car, there was never that moment that I think a lot of people have where they're just like, well, if it's broken, someone else does it. Like I already knew that it was possible to do it. And then also, I don't want to claim like some sort of great personal spiritual, (laughs) you know, knowledge or something. Like I just, I was really lucky in the people that were around me, you know, they were all, they were all into it and they were all fun and they were all helpful. I mean, even the people in my life who were not car people, like my roommate at the time when I bought the duster before I learned how to drive, um, she didn't care about cars, but she was willing to help me move it for like street cleaning day and stuff. Cause I didn't have a driver's license. Even once I got a permit, it was like, I couldn't move the car without another adult in the car (laughs) with me. So, um, so I just, I had these great people around who, who thought it was neat that I was doing this and who were willing to help. And then because you know, I was definitely a reader, so I would get all these car magazines and I remember starting to read them and being like, okay, well, I understand the word the, and <laughs> ooh, blue, I got that. Uh, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> and But I just like kept at it, sort of looking at the pictures and, and reading this stuff. And then it's like, one day you look at it and you're like, I understood that whole article. Hmm. And it was so, so it kind of, it kind of like grew in me, I think like, you know, and then there was also just like need, right? Like Mm -hmm. I did not have another car. I had this car. I needed to get places. It had to keep working. And so your choices are to take it to a mechanic who is going to charge you a huge amount of money and maybe not fix it. Yeah. Or to figure out how to fix it, where if it doesn't work, you're only out your own time. So you went to, you mentioned art school, right? If you're really that into the technical side of cars, why not follow in the footsteps of your dad and go to engineering school? Um, So I, I am not, for all that I have just talked about working on things, I am not really a very good mechanic. I'm, (laughs) I'm really good at telling other people how things work after someone smarter has explained it to me. Okay. Um, But like, you know, and I can like figure out tips and stuff. Like I'm not, I, I, I don't hate math, but I also <laughs> don't love it. And I definitely did not love it when I was a kid. Like sure. I had a real hard time with it. You know, like I, I had the kind of grades where it's like, 
oh, you've got all A's in the humanities and like barely passing in all of, <laughs> you know, in all of the math stuff. So there are times where I wish that I had had, I think I had really good teachers in the humanities and not very many good teachers in the sciences and maths. Cause I like, there's a lot, there are times where I wish that I'd gone into like the sciences, mm. you know, I really like readings, you know, stuff in STEM. I think the space exploration is super awesome. My dad worked at JPL and, awesome. you know, I, we'd have open family day and it was so rad. I loved going there. I love talking to, to the scientists and I love it now, you know, like as a journalist, some of my favorite assignments are when I get to go talk to, uh, go talk to engineers or, or go talk to scientists who are doing something new and interesting and, and try and understand what they're telling me. Mm -hmm. And then explain that to, to people who are reading it. Like, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the stuff that I was good at, at least when I was younger, was, you know, writing and painting and stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So the art school, which was it like Art Institute or? No, I went to UCLA. Oh, um, okay. A, a legitimate art school. <laughs> <laughs> well, so is Art Center. <laughs> um. Yeah, I went to UCLA. I studied with some pretty amazing, um, some pretty amazing artists, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that that was useful in in coming into again in t coming into storytelling and understanding that everything has a meaning, every object has a meaning, mm -hmm. and so the way that the way that something works says something about the people who built it. The way that sure. it's put together says something about the people who put it together. And so it's worth asking those people for their stories and finding out why they did things the way that they did it. Okay. All right. Let me ask you a question about muscle cars. What kind of people were building muscle cars? <laughs> well, um, okay. So there's a lot of stories to be told about the muscle car era era. And there's a lot of sort of legend that's built up around it. Sure, yeah. But um, at the time, it was just cars, right? It was just yeah. cars being built. It was everybody's daily transportation being built. Mm -hmm. From what I understand and from the people that I've talked to, internally, the people designing the muscle cars and working on them, uh, they were a younger group than had been working and designing cars before. And they were also designing with younger people in mind. So there was definitely a knowledge that they were building something fun. Mm -hmm. There's also, it also corresponded with the rise of motorsports, as we understand it, mm -hmm. drag racing and NASCAR in mm -hmm. particular, but also like Trans Am yeah. and IndyCar. Like all of those things were just taking off at that time. And so, you know, horsepower was a big deal and um, style was a big deal in a way that it just wasn't before. Mm -hmm. um, young people had a lot of money for the first time, really. Because mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, it was like, there really just weren't that many young people who weren't in a war um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> previously. Right, there so, were a few of them in that time. So, and like nobody had really that much money. And then after the 50s, where like all these teenagers grew up without really being sent to war, like mm -hmm. they like had money. Yeah. Um, And so the people, the people designing the cars, they were aware of that. They knew they, I would say that they knew that they were doing something cool at mm. the time. Like it wasn't just like work as usual. Um, like, a, like there were some really passionate people who were doing it because it was something that they loved. I mean, it, it's sort of similar to some of the people who are working on the contemporary muscle cars where it's like, they are also racers. They also love the cars. Like mm. it, it's not, it wasn't just a job for them in the actual factories, <laughs> right? I think it was just a job and there was a lot of union disruption at the time. Um, there were a lot of, um, sort of civil rights things that were happening within the, like within the factories and stuff. So there was like a lot happening in the factories. I don't think that the, I don't think most of the people who worked on the assembly lines were like, oh my God, I'm so excited about this 1968 <laughs> Roadrunner with a Hemi, you know? Like, right. I don't think that that was, at least from what I understand. I mean, Tom's, um, Tom's older brother was a, um, like a line worker at uh, the Van Nuys uh, Chevrolet plant and he like built a Camaro and stuff. He knew it was cool. Yeah. Like he built himself a Camaro. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's really, that's um, really cool. Actually. It is cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, so I would say that some of the people who were doing it 
who are actually physically building them, if that mm. was the question that you asked, were aware that there was something neater about the cars that they were building than the cars that they had been building. But I think for most of them, it was just like stamp in, stamp out. And right. Yeah. Go home. Assembly line work. Yeah. yeah. Any interest in anything 80s, 90s? Because I noticed that you made a little note. You gave me this amazing cheat sheet and I'm forever <laughs> grateful for that. I am very organized. I envy people that are. So <laughs> when it comes to your little cheat sheet, it says, let me, let me go back to it. Actually, you don't own a car or a daily newer than 71. Yes. Um, I mean, we do own, we have a 78 dually and Tom has the, the 93 Cummins turbo diesel. Right. Um, so the 93 is definitely our newest vehicle, but really that's my husband's truck. I don't drive it very often. Got it. So it's like a work truck. It's his daily. Okay. Um, but like I'll borrow it sometimes if I have a, like a really long trip mm-hmm. to make just because it gets much better fuel mileage than anything else that we own. You go to uh, art school, legitimate art school, and you've read all these Not magazines. Not one of those fake art schools. Yeah, seriously. Like it was fakers. The four profits, the one that you see that are on television. Right? Oh, man. I'm just joking. Wherever it is that you win, if you listen to the show, don't get your panties in a bunch. You know, if you're doing well in art, congratulations. Uh, I just like to say really controversial things. Yeah, that was Apparently. pretty wild. Wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you, you go to art school and... You've been reading the magazines, it sounds like, right? So is that the transition? Because I'm looking at your resume, and I've seen some really great resumes. And when I looked at yours, I was like, this is far better than really great. (laughs) Like, you are a champ. So tell me the transition from reading the magazines into going about writing cars. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm finishing up art school. I'm working as an artist assistant. Uh, for a sculptor named Charles Ray. And he did a lot of mold making, a lot of sculptures that were, um, that um, they would cast molds for. And so I learned mold making while I was working for him. And around that time, right around when I was sort of ready to leave there, he he would hire people sort of for projects and when the projects would end, Mm. um, was when Tom and I got kind of serious. And so I moved out to the Valley. And so I was looking for a job. And um, first I found a job sort of, uh, I don't know, it, it, shop manager sounds so much more impressive than what I was really doing. I was like <laughs> reordering bolts and stuff for a race <laughs> team, a motorcycle race team, like just paint, like keeping track of what what they were out of and, okay. and restocking. Um. And then when I left there, there was a, a guy around the corner who made carbon fiber bodywork for motorcycles. And he had broken his shoulder in a motorcycle accident. And he needed somebody to help him. Mm. And he knew that I had the mold making experience and I'd never done any sort of carbon fiber or fiberglass layup, but he's like, well, you, at least you understand the concept. Sure. So um, I was, I mean, I was literally just a hand for him, like a, like he would, you know, he would use one of, you know, one hand and I would do the other because he had this <laughs> broken shoulder. So I learned a lot of mold making and I learned carbon fiber layup. And, um, and we started working a lot with, uh, AMA race teams, motorcycle race teams. And I was like, Ooh, motorsports is fun. I mean, I, I would watch NASCAR and drag racing on TV, but I mm-hmm. had never like been at the races or been a part of it. I, like worked with a team. I was like, this is really fun. And so I did that for a while. And, um, sort of moved into the office as we hired more people. And when I left there, I got a job doing automotive PR. And, you know, so like aftermarket companies like Hotchkiss and Flowmaster and mm-hmm. stuff. So it was like more motorsports, uh, more cars, and like learning a lot really fast about a lot of different cars. Mm-hmm. Um, because up until that point, I really only knew mu- like about Chrysler products because that was the okay. only stuff that I'd had. Mm-hmm. And... um Anyway, so I'm, you know, I'm doing the PR stuff and the whole time, like I, when I was reading the magazines way back when I was like, I want to do this. Like, this seems like such a fun way to be a part of the car community. It's like, you spend a lot of time in shops, you spend a lot of time at races, but you aren't actually responsible for making things work. You just have to tell how other people made things work. Like that just seems great. Mm -hmm. And I tried a bunch of times to apply to magazines when there were openings or whatever. And it was just like, no, (laughs) like most of the time I wouldn't even get an answer Mm. back. And 
um, I wasn't that bad at it. I mean, looking <laughs> back at it, at like my sample writing, I wasn't that bad at it. Mm -hmm. There are people who are worse, but, um, but I was just like, oh, I guess I'm just not qualified for this. And, and then I'm in PR and I'm working with all these people who are in the magazines. I'm like, how, what? No. And then David Freiberger, who was the editor in chief at Hot Rod was like, well, we have an opening. And I was like, but what about how I'm totally not qualified? And he was like, I think you're qualified. I was like, <laughs> <gasps> okay, okay, let's, let's do this. And so Freiberger gave me my first job at a magazine. And it was like, <laughs> it's like you go straight to the top. I mean, it was freaking hot rod magazine. Right, yeah. And I was so intimidated and so delighted. Like I couldn't believe that that was something that I was going to get to do. And it was truly every bit as awesome as it as you'd think it would be. Like it was so fun. Right. Um, and I learned so much and it was such a good team when I started there. I mean, it's a good team now too, <laughs> like it's not. but I mean, it was a really great group of people to learn with and everyone right. was very supportive and very interesting and very smart. So, um, that was sort of, you know, but it was, it definitely, it was like, it happened quick when it happened, mm -hmm. but it was 10 years of trying right. if that sort of makes sense. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that the listeners can figure out by your name and also by your voice that you are a female. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Nobody told me that. <laughs> so it, it, the car world is mostly men. And I know that there were some issues with other people just talking about how difficult it is to get into that little world. Did you have any of that as an experience? Because, you know, 10 years is a long time. At the time, I just thought I wasn't good enough to do it. Mm -hmm. um, looking back on it, I think probably what I was dealing with was um, you know, was some sexism in the industry mm -hmm. where people just weren't taking my samples seriously, weren't taking my resumes seriously, probably weren't really reading them. Um, but you never really can know, right? Sure. I mean, because that's the thing with, with sexism, with racism in the industry. It's like, okay, yeah, sometimes it's so obvious, mm -hmm. but that's the easy stuff. Like when it's, when it's so obvious that no one can deny it, you know what you're up against, but usually it's much more subtle than that. Usually it's things like, oh, well, you know, I mean, like we would hire women, but women never apply. And it's like, well, yeah. but what's your world like? How intimidating is it? How welcoming does it seem, you know, or, um, you know, like, oh yeah, we would love to have a black guy on the, on the staff, but you know, there's just <laughs> no qualified black guys who've ever, who was, uh, who've ever applied. It's like, well, what are you guys sending out there into sure. the world? Like, yeah. is it, is it something that says, Hey, this is a industry and this is a, a company that is going to take you seriously and is going to respect your, you know, your differences as well as where, where we overlap or is it kind of like, well, yeah, we, we'd take a woman or a person of color, but they basically have to act like a white guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one thing that I did, run into, which is actually, I think improved quite a lot since I started. But when I started, it was still super normal to have like babes on the cover and to have like bikini girl, like contests at the, at the car shows and to have like the girls of SEMA gallery. Sure. And, um, you know, and it was definitely something where I was just like, I can't say anything about this because then I'm just causing trouble. And, so I have to act like it's cool. And I'm glad that people are starting to not do that so much because I think that for women who are coming up, it's great that they don't have to act like that. It's cool sure. that they can be like, no, actually, if you want to do a Girls of SEMA post, maybe talk to some of the engineers at the companies who are women. I hate to abruptly transition into something different because that was an important and serious conversation. <laughs> but I'm going to do this selfishly because... I'm all about the experience. Sure. And I want to hear about your fun experiences uh, like during your tenure at Hot Rod. So tell me a fun story. Okay. Here's a story about Hot Rod. I was doing um, I was doing a history piece about the, the Hemi engine, the 426 Hemi engine. It was, mm -hmm. I think, the 50th anniversary. And I was going to um, interview Big Daddy Don Garlitz, who was a drag racer, sort of the first man to... Uh, really make the Hemi a competitive engine in drag racing. And also just, I mean, like an incredible innovator in, in the sport and in motorsports. 
And he's, uh, he's in his 80s. He's out in Florida and he has a museum out there. It's great. You should totally go. But um, so I flew out there, had this interview planned. And uh, he, he was great. He was super funny. And, um, you know, we had a great interview. And I was like, you know, I'll take you anywhere you want to go, you know, for dinner as a, as a thank you. You know, where, where do you want to go? And he's like, oh, yeah. There's a Waffle House around the corner. I was like, <laughs> really, really, Don? That's, I mean, I'll take you somewhere. And he's like, no, no, it's really good. You know, and like, <laughs> forgot what he had. It was like a 37 Chevy or something like that. But it was like a bench seat. And he wanted to drive. So it was like him and then me in the middle. And Tom had gone with me because he wanted to meet Garlitz. And so it was like the three of us on this bench seat. And he's like driving us to Waffle House. And I just, I just remember like sitting there in the middle, kind of like sliding around. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, I, how I feel like I'm in a movie or something, you know, like this, this is a man who up until this point has been just like someone that I read about when I'm doing research, like right, he's, you right. know, and I'm sitting in a car with him <laughs> going to Waffle House, you know, he's like, we're sitting here and he's like shaking toast at me to like <laughs> make a point. It was like, it was pretty good. That's, that's interesting to hear that Don Garlitz, one of the greatest drag racers of all time, <laughs> just wants to go to a Waffle House. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a man with uh, simple tastes, fast cars, and uh, fast waffles. I've seen a lot of journalists, especially people from Jalopnik, uh, <laughs> that kind of do a thing, and they don't like to deviate from that thing. Why do you think that is? Because for you, it's clearly not a problem, and you've written about everything. You're working for Edmonds right now. You're a freelancer, so you're you're all over. You're driving a Corolla right now, so it's not like... You just wrote about hot rods. The writing thing is similar to the conversation that we had about why why people would buy many of the same or similar car. You know it. You already know it, right? Mm-hmm. Like so, um, it's easier. And people like to be experts. And um, I think that we currently sort of have a we sort of have a journalism culture where people want to tell their own stories. Um, and I realize that it's ironic for me to be talking about this while I'm telling my own story, but I think most people go into storytelling as it being like, this is about me. And therefore they want to be experts in it. They don't want to be bad at it. Sure. Um, and so they write, they kind of tell the same version of the story over and over again, because they know that they can do that story well, and it's going to make them look good. And it's what they're interested in. Right. Um, for me, uh, I think I'm actually pretty boring (laughs) and, (laughs) and other people are very interesting. Um, and I really want to know why people make the decisions that they want to make. I want to know what's important to them. I want to know what frightens them or what inspires them. And for me, cars, cars are great. Mm -hmm. I really like them, but in the end, I don't care about the car as much as I care about the people that are behind the car um, or behind the wheel or own the car or sold the car or (laughs) built the car or imagined the car or raced the car. Like those, that's (laughs) like, to me, the, the car is just a tool to get someone to tell me their story. Right. Because if you go up, especially people who are like engineering types, if you go up to an engineer, just like out of the blue and you're like, Hey, tell tell me what you love. <laughs> They're going to be like stuff. They'll be like, uh, <laughs> I need to go. <laughs> but if you say to someone, you know, like, tell me how this works. Tell me why you chose these, these components. Tell me why, you know, tell me how you managed to make this better than the other ones. And like, all of a sudden you'll be like, you'll get all this information, you know? And, and in that you'll find out so much more about them, you know, like, uh, Like I'm, you'll talk to somebody, you know, like a racer, for example, you'll talk to somebody and the, and be like, you know, why, what made you so fired up to win? Like what gave you the energy to keep going when other people were quitting? And, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, I don't know. I just did, or just did. And you keep asking. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, I, I didn't really know much about my family, but you know, like my like they were really poor and we could never pay our bills. And I was really afraid that I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. So then I was like, well, I have to be able to pay my bills. And the only way I could pay my bills was if I won. And 
all of a sudden, like, you've got this, like, intense story yeah. that you can totally t- relate to where it's like, I had a childhood fear of having the failings of my parents and racing gave me a chance to not have those failings. And that is so much more interesting than yeah. just, well, you know, I saw the finish line. I wanted to get there. <laughs> Yeah, I think I got a little off track with that. No, answer. this is great. No, this is absolutely great. This is so the way that you want to hear the story is exactly the same way that I want to hear the story because the cars are great. Don't get me wrong. It's all about the, like I said, it's all about the experience for me. Like when I get into a car and if it's a boring car and I just don't want to drive it, I just don't want to drive it. I don't even <laughs> want to discuss it because the experience is so much more important than maybe most of the time the car. <laughs> And you, you opened something up for me as I never really thought about it this way is the people that are behind the car that are making the car that are engineering the car. They're so important. And I, I've talked to guys like Jonathan Ward of Icon, but that's a little different. I'm having a hard time thinking about like, let's say bringing a Prius engineer or a Camry engineer or you know, just name any other boring car. Well, so it's funny that you say that, right? Because yeah, I would think like, oh God, like Toyota engineers are going to be pretty boring. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I've been at events, like I was at Optima One Lap of America two years ago, maybe. And there was Mm -hmm. a team, I think it was a Toyota team that was running and they had a, uh, I can't even remember what car it was because it was so boring, but, (laughs) but it was like, um, you know, it was like a, a, a mule car for them but they had like, like they were totally testing all these different parts on it. And like the stuff that they were doing for, to make it through the race Mm -hmm. was like stuff that they might be able to put into a production car down the road, you know, like whether that was improving the brakes or improving the cooling or, you know, like giving it, um, a better throttle response or something like like, because they loved racing and the fact that what they were doing wasn't going into race cars didn't bother them because they were still so excited about the idea of problem solving. And so I think that's great. You know, I, I think that, you know, you might think like, oh, a Corvette engineer is going to be more interesting than a Prius engineer. But what you actually find out when you start talking to people who are in the industry is that someone might go from being a engineer on the Neon to being an engineer on the ACR Viper. Hmm. Like that's how the industry works, right? Like somebody might go from being a seat engineer to, you know, to being like adaptive suspension based off of like what they learn along the way and where they get moved to. And so um, there is no, I haven't met any boring people. Okay. (laughs) Like ever in the, in the industry. I mean, I've met some boring journalists. But, <laughs> but I've never met any boring engineers. I've never met any boring designers. Um, you know, I like everyone who I've ever met who makes something mm-hmm. has, has really been a delight to talk to. Yeah, I guess what is difficult for me to move aside, when you mention Neon and then when you mention ACR, it's kind of hard to have them both in the same sentence. Except there was an ACR Neon. There was, yeah. It was pretty <laughs> fast, actually. It was. it was. a turbo one, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Let's put the ACR Neon aside here. Neon was not a good car. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm just kind of stuck there because I think that engineers are... And, or maybe it's just a top-down issue. Well, again, you... All right. So first of all, whenever you look at something that isn't designed... And controlled entirely by one person, you have to be aware of what limitations the people who were working on it were working under, right? So if you're looking at something um, that's mass market, that's going to have a low price point, the people who are working on it have a lot of uh, restrictions on what they can do because they can't add in all the cool stuff that they want to, because that's going to bring the price up and they don't have that option. Like they have a budget and they have to stick to it. And, but they're, they are capable of finding solutions to problems that then can be applied later if they're working on more high performance stuff or on stuff that has a bigger budget. And so, um, I think that kind of idea is really interesting. And, and I, I think that that is something that you can apply in your own life with your own cars. Um, and I think it's something actually that Freiberger and Finnegan did really well at Roadkill, which is um, it doesn't have to be the perfect solution. It just has to be the solution that gets you moving. <laughs> and um, 
And if you're, if you're new to cars or if you've just got a project car, or if you're thinking about getting a project car and you're sort of like, you're always like waiting, always thinking it's got to be a certain level, um, like a kind of top shelf level, yeah. you're never, you're never going to get that, you know, you're not going to start there. Nobody starts there. And so it's totally worth just sort of being like, I'm going to do whatever's here in front of me and I'm going to learn something from it and it's going to be fun. And I don't have to worry about it. It's not like, it doesn't have to win awards yet. Sure. Um, and I think that if you talk to people who are at the top level of anything, um, you're going to, and you ask them what they started with, <laughs> very rarely, very rarely do they say like, well, you know, <laughs> I inherited $6 million. <laughs> and so, you know, my first car was a Lamborghini Mira and like, that, you know, I mean, there are some of them, yeah, but yeah. generally that's not the case. And a lot of people have really fond memories of like their crappy first cars or their crappy first projects even, or even their crappy first assignments yeah, because yeah. they learned a lot and the pressure was so low that they were able to really enjoy what they were doing. I want to talk to you about the snake and I'm not talking to Mulholland, Mulholland Highway here in Southern California. You're writing a book. I am. That's a pretty huge undertaking. In an article, you have like X amount of words, right? That you're supposed to write. But in a book, that's X amount of words multiplied <laughs> exponentially. So tell me about it. Okay. So this wasn't my idea. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, I'm super stoked to be doing it. Um, very flattered that um, Cartech and Prudhomme chose me uh, to do this, asked me to do this. Also extremely intimidated. It is, um, like you said, it's very different from writing an, a magazine article, mm -hmm. um, but I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's uh, So basically I'm co-writing or ghost I co-writing, I guess, because um, Don Prudhomme's autobiography. So Don the Snake Prudhomme, another famous drag racer, raced against Scarlet's, um, one half of the Snake and Mongoose, which Anybody who collected Hot Wheels probably remembers the <laughs> yellow and red um, Plymouths. And um, it's been, it's really interesting because um, a lot of times when you're just doing an article, you can kind of, if somebody's reluctant to talk about something, you can kind of just let it go because you don't have enough room for it anyway. <laughs> you can talk yeah. about something else, you know. Um, but with a book, um, you kind of have to push them a little. And he's been great. He's been, he's, interested in doing it. It was, you know, it was his idea, not mine. So, uh, he's not doing me a favor, <laughs> which is great. Um, you know, but it, there, like the other day when we were finished with our, our session for the day, I was like, I think, you know, he's like, man, you're, you know, you're coming up, bringing up some old stuff. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm saving you some money on, on, uh, therapy bills. He's like, <laughs> he's like, no kidding. But, uh, you know, cause it's, I, again, it's like, we're trying to go in and tell more. And this, again, this is him, not me. He's like, I don't want to just tell in this race, I won against this guy. And in this race, I won against that guy. Like, he's like, I want people to maybe understand why I was racing mm -hmm. and why it mattered to me and how I managed to make good decisions here, or bad decisions there and, and where that took me. Um, so it's been, it's been really interesting um, and like emotional you know, like I'm exhausted mm -hmm. at the end of every time. Wow. He must be too, but like every interview session, because it's like, oh man, that's a lot of feelings. Yeah. How long are these interview sessions? Um, The first one, one of them we did was really long. Like we spent all day and that was too long. Like we were both kind of grouchy. <laughs> at the end of it. So most of them have been probably about five hours. I feel like that's like a an amount where we're both still cheerful at the end of it. Right. That's five hours is a long time. It's a long time to be yeah. talking and thinking and remembering stuff. I wanted to ask you more specifically about the experience for you of writing the book. What was it like for you? You said that you were a little intimidated, but getting into the cycle, getting into the kind of groove of things. Well, I feel like we're going to have to re-meet in like three months and you can ask me that again because I've really, I mean, everything kind of came together at SEMA, which was in November. And okay. so All there's, right. um, I don't have a whole lot to, I don't have a whole lot behind me to tell you what it's sure. been like. Um, I would say that there's been, there's been some learning on my parts of like how to organize my questions, how to keep us on track so that it's easy for me 
to put things together later. Um, you know, uh, Prudhomme keeps making fun of me because he'll tell me a story and I'll be like, what year was that? How old were you? And I'll be like, ah, I hate it when you ask me that. Like, <laughs> like I hate it when I read a book and they tell you like this or that event and you can't figure out where it is in relation to um, whatever happened earlier or, or later. Like I'm a huge fan of being like, oh, that was 1968, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I've sort of, I've been picking on him a little bit for for that and um and then transcribing is just so awful like i hate it so much (laughs) ilana thank you so very much for coming out my pleasure it was really fun plus i got to hold a dog so this is when i ask people to do their plugs so please let people know where they can find you okay if you have any interest in my thoughts on new cars go to edmunds.com if you want to see what i'm working on in the garage weird cars that i spot on the road (laughs) and many 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 pictures of dogs Go to Instagram, challenge her. So that's challenge her. I can't spell it. You're going to have to. (laughs) Um, It's the same on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Facebook too under my name, Alana Sher. And um, you can read many things that I've written um, on Hot Rod. Uh, I've done some writing for Haggerty. I'm doing some work for Road and Track and for Automobile. I have a column in American Car Collector. Um, and uh, yeah, usually I sort of show up if you if you type my name in. There aren't very many Alana shares. So it's either me or the ballerina in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see pictures of her, I want you to assume that that's me. But you're going to have to keep looking to find my byline. The Road Stories podcast is recorded and edited by me, Michael Sandrovich. If you like the show, please leave me a review wherever you listen. It helps the show greatly. And finally, please follow me on Instagram at Rose Stories Mike. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>